Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verses 11 through to verse 22. The Apostle Paul writing says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. I'm very conscious that with the Church Away Day next Saturday, um, that there are themes that we'd like to explore that we're never going to have time to do in a single day. Um, That would just be impossible. Um, I suppose one thing we could do is have a church weekend, um, uh, maybe make that a church week, um, and, you know, you could go on forever. But actually the truth is that even if we had a whole church week, I don't think we'd explore the theme in all its fullness. And that's because the theme that we want to look at is an ongoing theme. Actually, it's not a new theme at all. It's one that we've been exploring for several years. And we keep coming back to it and reminding ourselves of it. And it's this whole idea that we are one people. We express it very often in the word family. That we are together that he has joined us together as one. And so today, I suppose, if you like, as a little run-up to next Saturday, I'd like to look at this whole theme of being one people and uh, give us a little introduction to what we're going to do on the weekend. There's been an awful lot of talk about those who are welcome and those who are not in our country of late. Actually, it's been going on ever since uh, this new term of government started back in 2010, wasn't it? In the run-up to the election, there was an awful lot of talk about should we restrict the number of people who are coming into our country to make it their own. There's been a lot of division over it all. This week, with elections taking place, local council elections taking place, there's been even more talk about what kind of people are we? Are we welcoming? Do we actually want people to come into our country or not? Particularly with the relative success of UKIP. And what does UKIP actually stand for anyway? Is it actually a xenophobic party? Or is it not? All those sorts of questions are coming to the fore. But we as the church have a responsibility to lead the way in these thoughts. 
And we can indeed get involved in society around us. It's good, I think, for Christians to be involved in our local community. How else are we going to be salt and light in this world? But it's good to to get involved, but not to be affected by, if that's possible, and tainted by the thinking of this world, but instead to add something of Christ's mind into the thinking of the people of this world. To add some of our Christianity back into the world. That's what we're called to do. Now, I could, of course, just encourage you all to go and sign up to all the local political parties. And let's face it, there are good, faithful Christian people in all of the main parties. So we're not going to say that one party is right over another and that if you're a Christian, you should vote this way um, and not that way. I know some churches will go to that length and that's not a new thing at all. I mean, Spurgeon um, used to tell his people how to vote um, and, um, uh, you know, who would disobey him? Uh, So, you know, I mean, it's not a new thing at all. But I'm not want to do, I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in telling you how to vote. What I am interested in is saying, how do we live our lives whilst we're here? Now, we have the wonderful situation of being a church that resembles a little bit of heaven. In the sense that we are made up of so many different peoples. We're made up of people from all parts of the world, many who speak different languages, some who speak English as a first language from other parts of the world and some who don't. And I appreciate that it is very difficult if your first language is not English um, or it can be very difficult uh, to try and fit in and be part of a church. But I believe that this is part of what it means to reflect what God is doing. The gates are wide open. People can come in from all walks of life into the church. But the problem is that the church can very easily become a very segregated, closed kind of place. And not just on nationalities. I think it's true to say that some churches, I wouldn't say they discriminate not directly at least, but maybe indirectly, there is some kind of, maybe discrimination is too strong a word, but certainly not welcoming to people from certain backgrounds. For some of them it would be from other parts of the world. For some it will be a class thing. I know of churches not a million miles away from here, where if you're not of a certain income bracket, you'd probably feel a little bit out of sorts. Church shouldn't be like that. Sometimes churches can be very unwelcoming to people who have physical or mental problems and issues. Sometimes churches can be ageist. We hear an awful lot about ageism today. Lots of groups that are ageist. Churches can get like that too. You know, if you're over 40, you're too old for this church. You're literally as young as that. Again, they wouldn't say it directly. But indirectly, they do that. There's nothing for anybody over a certain age. There's no real interest in people over a certain age. People who are single can often get sidelined too. Well, of course, we are a church for families. So therefore, if you don't have the typical makeup of the family, mum, dad, the 2.2 children, the cat and the bowl of cornflakes or whatever it is these days, If you don't fit into that, you won't be welcomed either. And I say that thing of mum, dad, and no doubt that will have flagged something up in your minds because, of course, we know that 50%, at least, 
of families now, marriages break down. But of course in the church, which actually the figure is slightly better than that, but, but it's not that much different. But we still have this thing in our heads sometimes that, you know, in, in church, it's, families are meant to be together. It's meant to be mum and dad. And, and I've heard it said before, you know, people who come along with single parent families are made to feel different. We need to be careful about all these distinctions that we make because we're supposed to be a welcoming church. But let's come to our text and see how this helps us this morning in trying to understand this a little better. I want to break this text down uh, into three sections. Um, The first section being verses 11 and 12. Then I want to look at verses 14 to 18. And then I want to finally look at verse 13 uh, with verses 19 to 22. And to try and help us to remember it and um, uh, to have some pegs to hang this on, um, we'll look at under three separate headings as well. The first one uh, I want to look at, remember the, ho- the overall title we're looking at is One People. But I want to look at the fact that um, we were distant by birth. Okay, we were distant by birth. And then we're going to look at we were divided by barrier. And finally, that we are descendants by blood. Okay, so it's distant by birth, divided by barrier, descendants by blood. Those are the the headings that I want to look at this morning. So let's go, shall we, and look at verses 11 and 12, um, the very fact that We were distant by birth. And in verse 11, uh, Paul reminds the Ephesians. Remember, the Ephesians are a Gentile people. They are um, a Greek uh, um, uh, people. That doesn't mean they came from Greece. They're they're kind of Greek in their thinking and their makeup. Um, They're part of Asia Minor. Today, that would be modern-day Turkey. And um, uh, they would be on the east coast of Turkey today. Um, But it was a very important city, one of the largest cities uh, in that part of the world at the time, a very wealthy city indeed. And Paul speaks to the church that has been formed and has grown. The year is around about AD 60, so the gospel has been out there for about 30 years, um, spreading around, and they wouldn't have had the gospel for 30 years, but Um, The gospel's been out there, but some of these people are clearly of a Jewish origin and so may well have been people from very early uh, days of the gospel as well. But Paul says to them this, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called, now derogatorily, uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcised. We are the elite. We are God's true people. We are the ones whom God really chose. And there is a danger that people of all walks of life can categorize themselves and say we are this and we are that and try and set themselves out over and above other people. And Paul is clearly taking a swipe at those people, perhaps some in the church at that time. Paul knew the church at Ephesus well. He spent quite a long time with them. And he knows the kind of people they are. And perhaps he knows that maybe it's even behind backs that that little group of Jewish converts kind of huddled together, referring to themselves as, well, of course, we're the elite, we're the circumcised group, not them. They're the unclean ones. We have to be careful of that in church today as well. But Paul says that 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 group, he says, remember, verse 12, that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Let's just try and pull that apart for a moment 
and just look at some of these phrases that Paul is using because this uh, uh, passage is actually completely bursting with meaning um, in almost every phrase that is said. Paul recognizes that those who are Gentiles are Gentiles by birth, not by choice, not because of anything they've done, that they've deserved it, but by birth, you, he said, are Gentiles. There's nothing you can do about that. I don't know where you were born, perhaps. Perhaps I do, I don't know. For some of you I do, for some of you I don't. But wherever you were born, whichever country you, you were born into, then you become part of that place where you're born. Whatever family you are born into, you become part of that family. There's not much you can do about that. Birth is not something that we have control over. It's something that happens to us. And Paul says that you Gentiles, you were separate from Christ because you were born outside of Israel, outside of Judaism. You were not part of what they inherited. There's nothing you can do about it. That's the first point. You were separated from Christ by birth. Secondly, I want you to notice that he says that you were excluded from citizenship in Israel. Now, it is true, of course, that there were people that came in and, and, and became Jews through marriage, usually. So usually, those who became Jews were usually women who had married in. So we get some examples. If you look at um, the family line of Jesus, the genealogy, um, as recorded in the opening uh, chapters of Matthew and of Luke's Gospel, you'll notice that in there, there are uh, five Gentiles that are mentioned in his family line. Um, all of them women. And the reason is because that they have married in to the family line. But they were recognized, and I think it's significant that they find their place in Scripture and are recognized in Scripture as part of that royal line, that covenantal line. It's very important to know that even from those early days, God did not want to exclude anyone, actually, from knowing him. The Jewish people were there. They were set up as a nation because God wanted the world to know about him. It was part of his revelation. God had made himself known to his people in several ways uh, at different times in the past. God was trying to make himself known from the beginning. Let's just quickly go back. Um, Adam and Eve in the garden met with God in a very special uh, manner of communion. They walked with him. They had conversations with him. There was something very tangible about the relationship that they had with God, but alas, that got ruined, as we know. The fall came. They got pushed out of the garden, out of the presence of God, separated from him. And God had to try and put things right again. How did God do it? Well, God tried um, and just shows when I say God tried, God knows what he's doing. Let's just clear that up. God knows what's going to work and what's not going to work. But this is what God did. God said, OK, as the evil that came through Adam and Eve spread throughout the whole of the world, God says, let me show you, first of all, plan B, uh, sorry, plan A that, 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 that does not work. Plan A is this. Let's cleanse the world. Let's do a cleansing process. And there are nations who have tried this over the years, who thought themselves superior and have tried to do this kind of, of ethnic cleansing of um, nations. Second World War, Hitler, the Jews, etc. particularly. But it doesn't work. 
And God said, let me show you what happens when you try to cleanse the world of sin by killing off everyone. And so came Noah. Noah was a man of righteousness. And he and his family, just eight of them, ended up in this boat that he built, the ark. And God saved this righteous group of people. And yet from them came yet more sin. The seed was there. The gene is there. You can't get rid of it. And as the family grew, so sin grew as well. So God says, okay, let me now show you plan B. Plan B is this, that I will um, make a people for my own. And so he calls Abraham. And he, he says to Abraham, makes a promise to him. He says, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore, as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he says to him, he says, you know, your descendants are going to be massive. Why? Because, he says, I want these people to be a model to show everybody else how they should live. It was very clear, very early on, that actually this family that Abraham had, and we often speak of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's very important to get those three in line, because if you don't get those three together, you don't have that line that you need. For instance, you could have Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That wouldn't be God's people. Um, you could have Abraham, Ishmael. wouldn't be God's people. So it has to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob going down that line. And from Jacob came the, 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 the 12 tribes of Israel. And, of course, we all know what happened with uh, Joseph and his sons. And uh, many of us will know the story well of Joseph and his coat. And you see just how evil people had got. They were prepared to sell, even kill, if they had the chance, their own brother. And God says, you need some rules. And so after a time in captivity, God releases these people, and he then says, okay, let's put some boundaries in place. And so the next plan is this, the law. The law comes there. You keep the law. But nobody could keep the law. They were hopeless at it. They kept breaking it time after time after time. And so God says, now I have proved to you that cleansing the people by killing everybody off and just keeping the most righteous ones alive will not work. By keeping a nation for myself, you'll soon see that sin spreads. By giving them laws to obey, you'll soon find that they keep breaking them. They can't keep those laws. And therefore, I have one other plan, and that is to send somebody who is perfect, who will keep the laws, and that is Jesus. But of course, the Jews kept thinking about their physical lineage. So therefore, it was very important to them that you could prove that your uh, descendancy and ancestry went right the way back to Abraham. Abraham is our father, they said. Now, at different times, God had to punish the people for their wickedness. The nation split into two unequal halves. You had Israel in the north, um, sometimes called the Ten Tribes. You had Judah in the south, the southern kingdom. Um, and uh, the northern kingdom was taken off into captivity, first of all. They were taken away uh, by the Assyrians in the year 722 BC. There they were dispersed among the peoples of the Assyrian kingdom. That's how they kept uprisings from happening. By spreading the people thinly on the ground, you were unlikely to get an uprising. The southern kingdom of Judah was also taken into captivity around about 150 years later. Seventy years after that, they were restored back to their land again. Now, the thing is that by this time, you've got some of the people from the northern kingdom of Israel saying, actually, we belong to God's people too. But actually, they couldn't prove their ancestry. And so were excluded and became the Samaritans. And they were despised by the Jews from Judah in the southern kingdom because they could not prove their ancestry. They were excluded from citizenship. 
Now, if they were excluded from citizenship because they couldn't prove their lineage, what hope is Paul's argument of somebody like you Ephesians who've come from Asia Minor, from Greece, from Rome, from other places around? What hope is there of you ever proving that you should be part of Israel? You are excluded from citizenship in Israel. There is nothing you can do to change that point. Now, of course, it is true to say that there were some that were described as the God-fearers. Now, they were non-Jews who worshipped God all the same. But the Jews still saw them as second-class citizens. And they were not considered to be uh, heirs of all the promises that God had made. I want you to notice also here um, that they were distant by birth, and we are distant by birth, because that we are foreigners to the covenantal promises. The covenants that God made to his people contain many blessings. Blessings of land, blessings of prosperity, blessings of growth, blessings of God always being with his people, blessings of righteousness, blessings of a king who will lead wisely, blessings, of course, of a messiah who will rescue them from their enemies. He says, you who by birth are distant, are foreigners to all of those promises that were made exclusively to Israel. Therefore, because we have been separated out, because we've been excluded from citizenship in Israel, and there's nothing we can do to get that, because we're foreigners, therefore, to the promises that God has made, we are hopeless people. And we are godless people. We are hopeless because there is no chance of entering into the promises, apparently. Not in a natural sense, at least. No hope of becoming part of God's people in a natural sense. And godless because there is only one God there is only one true living God, and he belongs to Israel. And so we are distant by birth. But if we're distant by birth, then secondly, we are divided by barrier. Notice verses 14 to 18. For he himself is our peace who has made the two, and there he's talking about the two peoples, the Jews and the Gentiles, by making the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So we were divided by a barrier, a wall of hostility that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. But he has destroyed the barrier, we're told. Notice that it's called a dividing wall of hostility. In what way is it a wall of hostility? I think it's a wall of hostility because, in the first place, um, anyone who wants to enter into the promises that God has made, anyone who wants to become part of God's people under this old Jewish system, was rejected. There was nothing you could do. They were hostile towards the Gentiles. We have the promises. We have the only living God. He belongs to us, said the Jews, and you can't have him. And so it became hostile towards us. It also became hostile because, you know, if you're on one side of the wall, on the south side, if you like, the sun is shining, and on the north side, it's pretty cold and dismal. And you can use that picture because there are two sides to this wall. And apparently on the one side, you were there with God's blessing. The sun of righteousness rising upon you. And on the other side, you had nothing to look forward to except God's anger and wrath that was getting ready to be vented upon 
the nations who were disobedient. There's so much of that in the prophets. Look through some of the Old Testament prophets. Just see what God says to the nations around Israel. Because they were godless people, because they were not in possession of the covenant that God had made. It was a bleak future for them. But Paul does go on to give us a little more explanation about what this wall of hostility looks like. He describes it as being, um, and you'll see it there in, in these verses 14 to 18, that it's all to do with the law. It says he abolished in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And in this way, he destroyed this wall of hostility. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Jews were um, in the, the, the practice of lots of rituals, sacrifice in particular. But also there were other rituals that were associated with their worship that only they were allowed to do. Now, this was made very clear through the structure of the temple. And the temple was divided by walls. So you had an outer court, an area where anyone could go, a court of the Gentiles. And then from the court of the Gentiles, you could go through some doors into another court. And this was called the court of the women. And so anyone um, uh, could go through into that section um, uh, from, uh, from the outer section if you were a Jew. And then you had another door going in again to uh, uh, another, um, uh, you, see, you can see the, these courts getting smaller and smaller. You're going through to another court inside of that. And this was the court of the men. And only the Jewish men were allowed to go into that particular area. And then there was yet another wall dividing off, and you could go through more doors and come into another area. And that area would be the area for the priests. And the priests did all their things inside that, and nobody else, unless they're in the priesthood, could enter into that area. And then there was another area inside of that, as you go right into the heart of the temple. And you eventually come to this place called the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest was allowed to go, and only to go once a year as he went to make atonement on the Day of Atonement. And so you see that even in the way they, they, they constructed their temple, there were all these dividing walls that stopped people from coming closer to God. And that you had to be a little bit holier and holier to get closer and closer into the center, into the place where God lived, into his dwelling place there right in the center And the Jews cleansed themselves through rituals, made themselves holy to come into the presence of God as close as they dared and were allowed to go. But these people, these Gentiles, they were excluded from this. Not a chance of getting close to him. You stay in the most outer part and come no nearer. There is this dividing wall. The sacrifices that the Jews were making, well, they're no good for you Gentiles. They'll do nothing for you because God has not accepted you and God has not prescribed these for you. They will not do anything for you. That was the idea and the thoughts of the Jews. And so that just as we were um, uh, distant by birth in the first place and then divided by barrier. Thirdly, there is great hope because you are descendants by blood. Descendants by blood. Verse 13 tells us, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away 
have been brought near through the blood of Christ. You see, these sacrifices that these Jews were putting all their faith in, sacrificing over and over again animals, literally hundreds of thousands of animals were being sacrificed. Over and over again, year after year, they were doing the same thing. And now, Jesus has brought down this wall of hostility that didn't allow us to come through by making a sacrifice once and for all that no more sacrifice is necessary. That has now been cancelled out. He has fulfilled the obligations and the requirements that God has for sacrifice. The reason that they kept making sacrifices again and again and again was that God was not satisfied. Every Passover in the time of Jesus, a quarter of a million lambs were slain. A quarter of a million. And God said, I'm still not satisfied. And it's only when Jesus finally went to the cross and he became the Lamb of God who took the sins of the world upon himself that God finally looks down and says, now I am satisfied. Jesus looked at him as, as John uh, saw him coming and, and John declared him to be the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, said John the Baptist. And Jesus came to him for baptism and as he come up out of the water, there's that voice from heaven, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. This is the sacrifice that I've been waiting for. This is the one that I've been looking for. This is the one that will finally satisfy my anger once and for all. And Jesus was obedient to the point of death upon the cross, thus satisfying the anger and the wrath of God. And therefore he is able to say now that that wall that prevented us from coming to God has now been removed. And he made that very clear as Jesus hung upon the cross, as the temple um, curtain was torn in two, we're told, from top to bottom. God tore that open and said, now the way has been made open, the Holy of Holies, the very place where only the high priest alone could go on the Day of Atonement, after going through all the ritual cleansing himself, has now been opened to people like me and you. That we now may enter into the Holy of Holies. And as a result of God's satisfaction that he is pleased that now he has found that perfect sacrifice, the way has been made open. You can come to God. You can come to the God of the Israelites, the God of the Jews, but he's much more than that. He's the God of this world. He created it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It all belongs to him. And so do you. If you give yourself to him. He says, I welcome you. Come into my presence. We've been brought near by the blood of Christ. What does that mean for us? Well, let's look at verses 19 to 22 particularly. Because firstly, we notice that we are citizens with Israel. He uses the word here, fellow citizens. Israel, you can't have this God to yourself. You can't be exclusive. The door is open. And we welcome others in. You are not an exclusive nation. You were meant to be a model nation, but you failed. And now Jesus came to be the model instead. And he showed us the way and opened the door. And now we are welcomed. We may not be Jews by birth. We may not be Israelites because of our ancestry in blood but we are because of our faith in the blood of Christ. And so we draw near to him and become 
heirs of the promise as well. So we've become fellow citizens, first of all, with Israel. We're equal with them. That's something we struggle with today in many cases in this country. I'm, I'm now talking about, not spiritually, but coming back to where we started, that you know, there's this thing about, should we be exclusive? We don't want to open our borders up. Actually, what right do we have to close off anyone from moving around? And likewise, if you want to go somewhere else, then, you know, this world belongs to our God. And therefore, because the earth belongs to him, that we have that right, in a sense, to roam. And I know there's always going to be issues with border control. And we can say, and perhaps some might argue quite rightfully, that hang on a minute, we can't sustain ourselves if we keep letting more and more people in. But I want us to see that there is a model here of how the church should operate as well, how Israel needs to operate, how God's people operate, that we open the doors far and wide because we might have limitations as little Britain here. But God's kingdom has no limitations. And therefore, anyone is welcome to come in. The place is waiting for more people. I want you to notice from these verses as well that we take up membership of God's family. Membership of God's family. That you have become members of God's household, verse 19. That's quite something, to be a member of God's household. To be actually brought in, he says, and you've become part of the family. Now, families in Israel and in that part of the world, going 2,000 years ago, operated very differently to how we see families, particularly in the West today. Families were more than just mum and dad and the kids. Families were extended it was aunts and it was uncles and cousins and also those who were brought into your household. Some of them may have been brought as servants, but they were treated as part of the family. Some of them may have been just people who were very lonely living on their own, but they were, if you like, adopted into the family and looked after. There was a caring society that existed. And people from all walks of life were brought into the family. And that's the picture and the model that exists for the church today, is that we are supposed to be a church with doors so broad and so wide that people from all walks of life and from all over the world and of all kinds of backgrounds are welcomed into the family. And that's what we do as the church. We welcome all. But notice that the metaphor changes a little bit as we go from verse 19 to verse 20. Because you're members of God's household built on the foundation. Now we've turned from a household, the people, to the structure itself, the building. And I just want to, as we, in the last few minutes here this morning, I just want us to think a little bit about this building that he describes because the building is clearly a temple. He tells us that explicitly a bit further on. He tells us that we are being built into a holy temple. But I want us to look for a moment at what this holy temple is. How it's constructed. What parts of the temple are there? The first thing that he tells us about this temple, this building that we're being built into in verse 20 is that it is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the prophets. Apostles we have no problem with. We know all about Jesus and his disciples who became the apostles. They spent their time during the, the days of the early church teaching the church, helping them to understand the scriptures, passing on to them the things that Jesus had first given to them. And so the church was built upon the teaching of the apostles. What about the prophets? 
who do the prophets refer to? Now, some people have said, well, of course, the prophets is just um, a, a, a general, generic term for all of the Old Testament. Therefore, what they're saying is that we're built on Scripture. It's the Old and the New Testament put together, and that's what we're built on. There are problems with that interpretation, and, and I honestly believe we have to reject that. In the first place, um, I don't think anyone actually realized the New Testament was being written. Okay. Secondly, um, with regards to the prophets, um, sometimes the scriptures are referred to as the prophets, but usually it's combined with the word the law. So it's built on the law and the prophets who would be, the whole of the Old Testament. But the point is that Jesus has fulfilled the law. Now, I know that Jesus also said that not one jot or tittle has been taken away from anything of the law of Moses. But he's fulfilled it instead. It's still there, but it's now fulfilled. There are still other parts that we need to obey. Therefore, the Ten Commandments are still relevant to us. So why would they separate out just the prophets? That wouldn't make sense. Now, I think it's better to understand that what he's saying here is this, that we now are built on a new understanding of Scripture, which has been brought to us through the apostles' teaching, which came through Jesus particularly, and also through direct revelation after the ascension of Jesus, and through the prophets who were New Testament prophets, who heard directly from God and spoke the word of God uh, to the people. And we sometimes find examples, just a few, of prophets in the New Testament who spoke the word of God. And so we find that these people who heard from God and spoke out the word of God, um, uh, that they were hearing directly. And as a result, we have together put together uh, a foundation on which to build the church. Now, the next thing that he mentions here is that there is the chief cornerstone. And the chief cornerstone is Christ. And some people have given all sorts of explanations as to what the chief cornerstone actually means. And I want to just take you, um, uh, you might want to, if you've got a Bible handy, just go to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. And this gives us a little bit of insight into um, building methods, if you like. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts in him will never be dismayed. The cornerstone was the tested stone. And what they would do when they constructed um, a, a, a building, particularly a large structure like a temple, is that the first thing they would have done is put the corner in place, the cornerstone. Now, you have to lay all the corners. It's a bit like, if you like, doing a jigsaw puzzle. Um, one of the first things you do, you, know, you get a rectangular jigsaw puzzle. It's got a thousand pieces to it. Where do you begin? Well, the place to start, of course, is the corners. Get those first of all. Get those in place. Then you look for the edges. And if you like, they kind of make the, the, the foundation. Well, in a similar way, what you do, though, with the building situation is you take one corner in particular and you set the corner in place. And you need to know that cornerstone is tested. It's tested in several ways. Firstly, it's a flawless stone. You can't have any flaws in it. You don't want anything happening to that stone. So it's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect in terms of no cracks, of course. It's got to be perfect in terms of making sure that it's absolutely square. It's got to be perfect in terms that it's level. And so when it goes into the ground, it has to be absolutely perfectly level. It has to be at the absolute perfect height. If it's too low, the whole building will end up too low. If it's too high, the building will be too high. So they get the stone and the master builder will make sure that the cornerstone is absolutely perfect first and tested. And from there he will then go and he will lay the next 
cornerstone. A second cornerstone. And even in those, what we would consider relatively primitive days, they have ways of checking levels and things like that to make sure that cornerstone is in exactly the right place in relation to the chief cornerstone. And then, of course, once you've done that, you can lay the next cornerstone coming up from the chief cornerstone. And once you've got those two cornerstones in place, you can then lay the fourth cornerstone over in the opposite corner. You can also check the level of that one from the first chief cornerstone. Once you've got all four cornerstones in place, you then lay the foundation stones across the bottom. And if they meet and they are level, they have to be right. But it's all in relation to the chief cornerstone. And that's how building construction worked. And therefore, it's very important for us to understand that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's in place first. The apostles and the prophets got everything from him. And then the building comes together. Thirdly, with this holy temple, we're told that it is joined together. It is joined together by believers. We become the living stones that make up the temple. And we are bonded together. Everyone knows that when you make a building, you don't lay the stones in line with each other. You lay them across each other. And you get a bond as they come across. And that makes a much stronger building as a result of it. And so that would have happened back in those days too. And Paul says what happens once you've got the foundation in place, and which is based on Christ, the next thing is, he says that you have to then bond the stones together. And if you pushed me this morning on what is the bond, I would say the bond is the love of Christ. It is Christ who bonds us together through his love. The love that he's made known to us and has shown to us becomes the cement that holds us together. And in this way we rise and continue to be built. We're not finished the whole point of what Paul is saying here is that this is an ongoing process. We are being built into the temple of God, which becomes, as he then goes on to explain, a place where God dwells. God lives within this building that he's making through his Holy Spirit. And that is exactly what we as the church are meant to be. We become from people who were distant by birth, divided by barrier, to being descendants by blood, and as a result, brought into God's household as part of the family and being raised together as a wonderful monument of God's wonder, might, and majesty in the great temple that he is building. There were several temples that were built for Israel, Solomon's was the first, a very grand temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And so um, we then have Ezra's temple, the second temple, which was a very poor temple um, uh, compared to Solomon's. Herod came along and extended that second temple greatly. He made it into something quite magnificent. In fact, Jesus' own disciples looked uh, at that temple, and they said to Jesus, Wow, what big stones, what an amazing building. How could this ever fall again, is what their question was. But God is making and building a new temple, a temple that continues to be built, a temple that I believe Ezekiel talks about. Ezekiel's temple is never going to be, I believe, a, a, a physical reality. It was always meant to be a description of God's church. Ezekiel goes into great detail as to the building of the temple. Why, people have asked, if it's never going to be a physical reality? I believe the answer is because the Lord spends um, great detail um, uh, on his church. He's not just concerned about the overall picture of the church. He's interested in the small details. He wants you to be part of those small, intricate details that make up this most magnificent of all temples, which is built up and finds its fulfillment 
in Christ. We're part of that. And we, as individual Christians and as a local church here, become part of that great work that God is doing. We need to know how to be better stones, how to be perhaps more finely honed, how to be smoother, perhaps more usable, how we can be greater works in the hands of the master builder. That's where we're going to go from next weekend. Let's pray.